Well, speaking of things that we don't respect and we don't particularly like, let's talk about SmackDown. Hey. Yes, let's. Uh, no, they, 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 did, they did something good for people this past week. They had the tribute to the troops, the 21st annual, and Bradshaw was, uh, JBL was on uh, uh, color commentary because it was his concept to do that back in, what, 2000 and. One or two, well, I can't do the math now. 2002, I think they did. This is the 21st. It's not, to, yeah, there you go. It was his idea is what I'm saying. And it was nice to see him again, but I'm glad he he mostly just does whatever the fuck he wants to do and, and drops in every once in a while over there. He's not, uh, he's perfectly happy playing golf. I, I enjoy that about him. Yeah, his wife is rich. Well, hey, he's got a few dollars too. Oh, yeah. I'll have you know, he saved his green stamps. No, he's a genius. But uh, the tribute to the troops began with Escobar versus Dragon Lee again. Again, I don't, he just, they just had that on the pay-per-view because Carlito, where is Carlito? Has, has he been kidnapped? They didn't say he was injured for real. I haven't heard of any arrests, suspensions, or firings. What the fuck happened to Carlito? It's weird when someone gets hurt and you don't hear anything, or when someone gets suspended and you don't hear anything, or when someone's just off TV after showing up after being off TV for 10 years. They got they us interested. <laughs> they tickled our taint. He's back. He's in the middle of this thing. It it looked great. We wanted to see Escobar and Carlito. All everything was pointing to that. They advertised the match, and then now, refresh me. They did an angle where Carlito. So Carlito, it's not like he walked out, went back to Puerto Rico, and refused to fucking participate. He did an angle backstage where they hurt him. Where that usually means that he was injured and in real life and that they're trying to cover for it but we've heard nothing about him positive negative or indifferent since that he's just gone right that sounds like what it is we'll see what we can find out i do have to make a bit of a correction and uh right here live in the show jace if you hear this we're going to edit this part even though we're going to keep this in the show we're going to edit this specific little part at the end of the nxt video clip I was wrong. I forgot what I saw last night. <laughs> oh. It was not Carmelo Hayes defeating Dominic Mysterio for the North American Championship. Carmelo Hayes defeated Alexis King, the former Brian Pillman Jr. Dragon Lee with Rey Mysterio defeated Dominic Mysterio for the ah. North American Championship. Ah. So, well, that just changes everything. So that was it. We got that result wrong. I got it wrong, not you. Well, I didn't see the whole thing. But Dragon Lee. I, was, I wasn't even there. Dragon Lee gets squashed by Escobar, who I like more and more every time I see him out there as a heel. And he doesn't look that great. And then he goes to NXT and he's a massive baby face. And he's got Rey Mysterio in his corner. It was like night and day from SmackDown. Well, but here, okay, then chronologically... He, uh, Dragon Lee takes Carlito's place on the premium live event and Escobar beats him in like eight minutes in a kind of a bleh match. And then they have Escobar versus Dragon Lee again on SmackDown here and Escobar hits his finish and beats him one, two, three. This time it took him 20 minutes. And then Dominic came in and stood over Dragon Lee and taunted him as Dragon Lee was laying there like a sack of shit because of their match for the NXT title that we just referenced the following night. And the following night, Dragon Lee, after he's got the shit kicked out of him twice in a row by Escobar, comes in and wins the fucking belt, is what you're saying? With Ray in his corner. With Ray in his corner. Okay, all right. So we got that straight now, right? Yeah, the booking of him on SmackDown has been uh, puzzling, I have to say. I don't see what... I don't... I'm not chasing the dragon here. I'm not on the dragon train. I don't know what's going on with this guy, but uh, to me, I don't, I'm not seeing it. But did you notice they had Nick Aldis 
in the back in his office with Randy Orton. Randy, who RKO'd Nick, the GM of this whole schmoz. They did a big package on his return. And then they're standing there in the office. And I like all the, Adam Pierce is kind of like the, the somewhat frazzled and beleaguered, hardworking, honest guy that's doing the best that he can and just wants to do his job. And you can tell Nick Aldis is just a fucking corporate ladder climbing, fucking power hungry son of a bitch who wants to run everything with an iron fist. But Orton came in and upset that because he's RKO. And remember I said earlier in the program, the one thing you can be sure of is Punk is not going to attack Aldous in any fashion or nobody else is going to be beating Aldous up because Randy's done it and will probably do it again and that's going to become his thing. He, maybe he's going to be Austin and Aldous is McMahon, but nobody else is going to get a hold of the general manager. But Nick has... Orton teaming with L.A. Knight against uh, Jimmy Uso and Solo on the show because uh, Aldis said that L.A. Knight, well, he saved you last week. And where's all he saved me? Well, and I got to trust this guy. I don't know him, blah, blah, blah. And Aldis is trying to put him at ease saying, oh, it'll be fine. So Orton has given, <laughs> Orton got fined 50 grand for giving Aldous the RKO, right? So Orton hands him a check and he looks, he's like, this is for $100,000. And Orton says, that's right. That's for next time. And he walks out. So we got that going. And and that's going to be fun. And Aldous is, has got that pomposity of being an upper crusty British fellow that the people are, are going to love seeing him get planted on his fucking face every now and then. Should they have all this chasing him down each week to give him back a check for the overpayment? And no, I think they should have one of the production assistants. <laughs> and he never accepts the money back. He never accepts. He's a, hey, you keep it, go buy you a car. Or he starts doing the RKO to the production assistants. Well, and then giving them the check back. I don't know. Anyway, we'll we'll leave that one alone. See, that's about as much thought as the writers actually give this shit. All this has been great, though. He actually has been a breath of fresh air on this show. He's very British. Very British. You don't know what he's going to do. You can't tell how big of a dick he is. <laughs> you know, like, there's still the mystery. Like, who's he going to really fuck over at some point? Well, so that's the thing. He's not really like a flaming heel is that you can tell that he's just, he wants to be a success. He Maybe they're patterning him after Vince a little bit. It's not going to be nothing personal. It's business. He's going to cut anybody's nuts off if it means his show and or he himself does better. Whereas, you know, poor old Adam is probably going to end up being the baby face in this situation as, as the guy who genuinely wants to do good. Like Adam's like the GM you can see showing up in a minivan. Yes, but Aldous, Aldous is coming in in the fucking, you know, the, the SUV with the black windows. Aldous gets out of the car with Vince. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Adam Pierce gets out of the car with me. <laughs> anyway, speaking of getting out of the car, Cody got out of his car, went into the building, and then came to the ring and did a promo. And... It got a big response, but it was the tribute to the troops uh, themed program. And I don't know if, I don't know if ev it wasn't everybody, but a significant portion of the audience was in uniform of some kind of another, whichever branch of the service they were in. Right. And so he got a big response. He introduced the tribute to the troops package that I I'm guessing was recycled from some time back because John Cena was really the only talent in it, right? And this wasn't new footage. So it, it gave the the flavor of the tribute to the troops concept, but <laughs> it was pretty much John Cena, right? Uh, which is probably for the best because he's the biggest fucking name. But anyway, there, there was no wrestling... Uh, content with Cody to this. He just, he came out, introduced that, thanked the troops and introduced the army drill team. And they juggled their rifles. And I mean, they're throwing them up in the air and they're turning loops and they're catching them. And I'm thinking, my God, this is a goddamn, a wrestling crowd with these guys doing this 
intricate shit. If anybody drops one of these things, they're going to blow the fucking roof. But <laughs> fortunately, they... Well, no, you know. They're not loaded. I mean, huh? They're no, not loaded. I'm not talking about the gun going off. I'm talking about the fans are going to hoot at this fucking guy. You fucked up. You fucked. It's a wrestling crowd. You know, they'd acted like it was the goddamn, it's like the bartenders do the bottles with the fucking acrobatic pouring and everything. Somebody drops a bottle, everybody applauds. I felt bad for these guys because they, they're there with the spotlights in their eyes and the fucking crowd in this arena. But they nailed it. They juggled the rifles and then they left. But that would be funny if the <laughs> dropped the fucking rifle and the rifle shot grandma <laughs> yeah. up in a cheap seat shot her right between the eyes. It wouldn't be funny. We're not saying it would be funny. Well, the idea is hysterical. Grandma though. could be a fucking bitch when she wanted to be. Can you imagine that, though? If the fucking rifle landed, bam, and it shot some woman in the fucking cheap seats between the eyes, and she just fell right over in the middle of her popcorn? No, she fell over the I'm, rail. and <laughs> over the rail and does a fucking flip and lands on somebody down in reserved and breaks their fucking neck. Now they're in a goddamn wheelchair, and they've got to be represented by <laughs> Stephen P. New, 877-50-STEVE. Oh, good lady. It could set off a chain reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot the woman. She falls on the... When the guy's neck gets broken, he shits himself. When he shits himself... Someone slips guy, on it. <laughs> somebody slips on it. Behind falls down the fucking stairs. It's a Rube Goldberg goddamn contraption. <laughs> I'd watch that show. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's... How many people can we kill with one shot? <laughs> well, speaking of which, got... let's uh, go back to the uh, weekly death that is smacked down. Moving on. So Lashley and Karrion Cross, that they're having a tournament here in Wee Land now uh, to determine who's doing what to who. Help me again. What title Number shot? Number one contender get? for the U.S. title held by Logan Paul. There you go. And there's eight people in it, basically four people that you figure might win and four job guys. And this was Lashley against Karrion Cross. So you see which one neatly fits in the other compartment. And besides, again, who's the heel here? Why am I... If you don't want to actively cheer for someone or root for someone or at least have some minor interest in one of the two people winning you just watched a fucking match and then it defaults to who's the biggest star well lashley's the biggest star that means most people are going to fucking cheer him but usually the reason why heel versus heel matches when presented very rarely and sparingly would draw is because if you book two heels against each other, they were two heels with both with heat that the fans wanted to see each of these dastardly assholes do the horrible things that they do to the baby faces to each other because they deserve it, and which that doesn't fit here either. And it's so it, it seems like it might not be hard to at least have some baby faces and heels in the tournament also instead of just blah, picking names out of a hat. But nevertheless... What did we see in Karrion Cross in another lifetime? He was bald and intense, and he had a good entrance in the smaller NXT environment, and he had a valet that stood out, and they worked well together, and she was really good at lip syncing. And. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Well, boy, how. Were we wrong? That's the question. Yes, yes. See, for the people who's, who never. who say I never admit when I'm wrong. I mean, the the growing the hair hurt, the change in their presentation hurt, the fact that he was brought up and couldn't succeed at anything hurt, the the promos really hurt. We didn't hear that many of them in NXT. All he was doing for a while there when they brought him up was these horrible, memorized, hokey, dramatic promos. I don't remember so many of those in NXT, but nevertheless, he went from somebody we thought, well, this guy's got a lot of potential to, oh, Jesus Christ, what happened? And I saw the first minute or two of this. It was sloppy, awkward, and plodding. 
and they went to the break, and that was enough for me. Uh, when they came back, Lashley beat him with a spear, one, two, three, after a while. She don't even lip sync like she used to, and she wasn't falling and praying. She was just, she was lip syncing, but not. I think their prayers ran out. Yeah, they, well, she, she, they may have fell, fallen, but I don't think they prayed enough. But then came the nine o'clock hour. And Brian, you know what that meant. Like Mussolini! Got fired by Tony, and now he's in the WWE. Oh, it's the cult of draw me money, please. <laughs> now with more money oh, and viewers too. Mindy's Bakery's open seven days a week now. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, come on. That's not like you to give up halfway through the song. You didn't prepare more. I, I, I'm, I'm unprepared. That was good. But no, but that's, again, you look at here at the nine o'clock hour now, which he even referenced. That's the first thing he said. Hey, for those of you who haven't noticed this, it's the top of the nine o'clock hour. I'm in the middle of the show. I'm not going to get my time cut. So go ahead and chant all you want. Because it became a thing that he got his time cut before. But uh, it was... This was what, first of all, the music plays. He gets the ovation, the music, the singing, the chants. He's wearing the Hell Froze Over shirt. The announcer is a free agent. Where will he sign? Bradshaw put him over big. And now he had the time to do the promo. He had 12 or 13 minutes instead of six. And, and yet again, this was what what we needed he he not only did his normal thing where he talks like a reasonable person and connects with people but then he starts firing up a little bit uh, so you want to see the prickly cm punk well i can do that and he starts mentioning people he asked the fans raw or smackdown which one do you want to see me go to? And and he gets them fired up in that. Do you want to see me throw out 29 other stars in the main event or 29 other stars in the Royal Rumble and main event WrestleMania? And that gets chance. And, it, then, you know, he references people we talked about earlier in the show, and we'll rehash it here because it's been a while. All of the other baby faces that he has to interact with, there's a different level of acceptance of him by them. Going from Seth Rollins completely, fuck this fucking guy, all the way to Cody shaking his hands, welcome back, old friend, and everything in the middle. And, you know, he starts off right at the top, the old friend who welcomed me back the most, which we later find out or we find out pretty much here, Cody says, what do you want to talk about? But maybe it should be more like, who do you want to talk about? And, you know, he mentioned the spicy shit, but now he's more comfortable now that he's got back home. He's going to get the, put the feet up on the couch. And he mentions Roman, I acknowledge you. Congratulations, epic reign. Don't forget who the OG Heyman guy is. He was my wise man first. So now that's open. And he shouted out Jey Uso. But now does he need to fight with Jimmy and Solo? If he needs backup, can I tag with Orton? You know, because somebody wouldn't want to tag with me. You know, maybe like L.A. Knight or Kevin Owens. And then that's when he hit the fucking line. Kevin Owens, he punches people in the locker room and backstage. You can't do that in 2023. That's insane. And like we said at the top of the program, the people didn't react. There was a few. But for the most part, that audience doesn't know. But he, you saw the smirk on his face. That wasn't a reaction line. That's also one of the Bucks pals that he's talking about, Owens. Well, yes. And, and also the fact that he said that and smirked at the camera and looked right at Cucamonga when he said it and then moved on to the other stuff that he's going to say that draws money. 
And if they wanted to be childish, he could make childish remarks on a program watched by four times as many people. But it worked both ways. And, uh, you know, again, for the target audience that, you know, likes that kind of thing, that's the kind of thing those people like. And he mentioned everybody's really welcomed me back except that one guy who's got a whiny voice and he's not even the man in his own household. <laughs> Boom, shots fired. <laughs> I'm a visionary. <laughs> well, if he's a visionary, he should have seen that one coming. But anyway, and and so then he's, we're going to find out on Monday at Raw where I'm going to sign. And everybody that I've mentioned has one thing in common. CM Punk is in their way. And you, everybody's talking about finishing stories. Well, I'm back to finish what I started. And that's to main event WrestleMania. And boom. He said he mentioned people. He set a goal for himself. He teased the fans with where he might go and what he might. You want to see me throw out 29 other guys? Of course they do. There's directions all over the place. There's multiple things set up. There's a stated goal. Other people that have stories to finish their stories would mean that he might not be able to finish his story. So at what point? Does that become more important than friendship? Because somebody said he wasn't here to make friends. He's here to make money. So all the people that he's shaking hands with now, that may or may not last. And uh, that's what it's questions for fans. to. That's what Vince used to in the smaller production meetings with the creative team and the agents, not the broader ones. And the announcers would be, he'd say, are we telling stories? Are we getting them to ask questions? Not because they don't know what's going on, but are they asking the questions we want them to ask? We want them to be at, we want them to be anticipating these things that they're going to make themselves want to see. That's Vince's shit. And that's honestly fucking common sense. So that's what they did here. And again, it was 12 minutes, not six. Mentioned names, stated a goal, got a little more prickly, got under some people's skin without trying to do a smart fucking promo that nobody understood. I say bravo for this one. What do you think? I thought it was great. It was exactly what it kind of needed to be. The Raw promo was so disappointing. There was no time for it. The crowd was into it other than the Bucks line because no one knows anything about it. I thought it was really good, and they've done a great job a month and a half, two months out from making you want to see that Royal Rumble. What's going to happen? Multiple people have already declared. They made a big deal out of Cody just declaring himself that he's going to be in it. And now Punk's kind of said he's going to be in it, so they're already building that Rumble up, and I'm looking forward to it. But think of the number of people for once this year that you would want to see, or some fan... Some segment of fans, not just one guy in a fucking, you know, basement in Cleveland, but large numbers of fans would want to see Cody win, would want to see Punk win, would want to see uh, L.A. Knight win, would want to see Jey Uso win, would want to, and you Orton. can, uh, Orton win. You can tell the story, Jey Uso wants to win to fight his fucking cousin again. Everyone has a story. That's the great thing. I mean, he LA, said it. LA. Punk said LA it in that Knight promo. wants to get even with for fucking the other the other month over there in Saudi Arabia. Cody has to finish his story. Punk has to achieve his goal. Everybody has a different singular reason for needing to win the Royal Rumble. And again, Punk brought up he's the OG Paul Heyman guy. So there's the thing that immediately ties him somehow into the bloodline story. Just actual history. If he was to win to face Roman Reigns, can you see Roman looking like, wait a minute, can I really trust you, wise man? And they've already had the kerfluffle in the past over Brock. Do you get a title shot automatically at Roman Reigns, or because there's a new championship with Rollins, is that on equal footing? You have to pick which one. Because this is the first year it's been there. Well, that's a good question, and I would think you would get to pick, much like a if, if if the Money in the Bank briefcase can pick, can't the winner of the Royal Rumble pick? 
So you have that dynamic too, because they are building up Rollins Punk without either one saying the other one's name. Yeah. Well, and I don't think it's not going to be Punk and Roman, but I'm saying that if you if you did that, there's a there's a story to it. If if somebody gets hurt, you change your mind. Okay, we got to do this. Well, there's there's stories to all of this shit. So you got different ways to go. But I still I still th I think. Punk and Rollins and Cody and Roman, if they don't have The Rock and... Who knows? Rocks are harder to get a hold of these days. Does AEW look worse and worse every day that goes by that CM Punk doesn't punch someone in the face? <laughs> or make someone scared for their life? I think he's too busy giving out free neck rubs and aromatherapy treatments. And then after this interview in the back, they had him outside the bloodline door and he raised his hand like he was going to knock and he's thinking about it and he says, ah, fuck it. He turns away and there's Owens and they kind of exchanged tense words and somewhat of a reluctant, I can't remember his handshake fist bump, but it was like, yeah, we're good. Okay. So it wasn't love and tenderness, but it wasn't, we're going to fight on sight. But he just so called him out, even in kayfabe, he just called him out in the ring. So I thought it was an interesting, short, simple segment. I like it. Again, where are they going to go with these two now? Hopefully not far for long. And then when Punk walks off, that. when Punk walks off, Owens is walking the other way. He stops and turns around to see Punk where he's going. Yeah. Well, he's going he's gonna to be looking over his shoulder. You never can tell. And then we got Charlotte and Oscar. And now this, uh, did you see the, the break spot where the incident occurred? I saw the video going around because I guess people weren't sure what she did that she hurt herself. And then the video made it pretty clear what happened. Well, this was going to be, you know, I wasn't going to watch this, but I didn't really have to fucking ignore anything because they had a bad girl fight in the entrances with all the seconds where you have the Oscar's whole group and Charlotte's baby face friends where they all fought off and Charlotte and Oscar got started and she did the Charlotte did her moonsault off the top rope to the floor and they went to the break in 90 seconds and I didn't intend to come back on it but I had heard already by the time I watched the program on the internet, what had happened, they come back from the break and both girls are laid out selling in the middle of the ring. And the referee's talking to Charlotte. And they, they're they there, and then the referee says something to Oscar and uh, there, there's some communication. And then Charlotte gets up limping, favoring her left leg. And as I mentioned, there was a lot of, they were calling something on the fly of how to get out of this. And Charlotte limped into a figure four barely and kind of, she couldn't really do anything with her left leg and even got most of the bridge up. But Bailey reached in and pulled her, pulled Charlotte's arms out so she lost her bridge. And Charlotte hops up on one leg and nails Bailey off the apron and Oscar schoolgirled her one, two, three. I assume they were probably going to go longer and there was some element of interference in the finish that may have borne some resemblance to what they were going to do. But what had happened in the break is that they were fighting on the top rope and it looked like that they were going to get in position. They were in the position where Charlotte was facing the ring and Oscar had climbed up the turnbuckles and if you were if if Asuka was going to give Charlotte a superplex, they were kind of in that position. And Charlotte was, had her feet on, I believe the was she on the second turnbuckle or was she all the way up on the top turnbuckle? Uh, I think she had gotten up to the top when I think, they both yeah, slipped, right? She'd gotten up to the top, and she had a hold of Asuka, and Asuka lost her balance standing on, that's what it was, she was standing on the second buckle, and she started going backwards, and since Charlotte was holding on to her, it pulled her forward, and whereas Asuka could just go backwards and land on her back in the ring, 
Charlotte flipped forward sideways off the the top rope and landed or off the top turnbuckle and landed with her legs over the top rope, which immediately whiplashed her, whipsawed her, whatever, back around to where she landed, I believe, knee first on her left knee in the middle of the ring. Because I don't think this would be an ACL tear because she didn't have any weight on the leg. I think it was when she was whipped around it with such velocity, if she had driven her her kneecap into the mat, it would not only hurt like fuck, you wouldn't be able to walk on it, but it could still be a debilitating injury. And remember I've told a story when I got nailed off the ring by Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam 96, and I started to take a regular bump off the apron but then I realized at the last second I was supposed to stay on the apron to draw the referee, and I tried to grab the rope and keep myself on it. I spun around, boom, kneecap first into the floor, and it almost it almost busted the bursal sac, and the point being I had to have tons of blood drained off of it. It's not a pleasant procedure. That can fuck your knee up too without tearing a ligament. But she either landed on the point of it or maybe the whiplash of hitting the rope at that speed possibly may have torn some cartilage or done something. But the point is she gutted out to get out of the thing as best she could. But God damn it. I know I bitch all the time about how they all fight forever gingerly on the top rope. But think about how stupid this is. It's only a foot and a half difference, 18 inches, between the second rope and the top rope, and it becomes 10 and 20 times more dangerous. The superplex was started by the superstar, Bill Eady. He had his feet on the second rope on either side of the turnbuckle inside the ring, and the fucking guy he was giving it to you could crotch the guy on the top rope or you could pick him up and set him on the top rope, but he could set on the top turnbuckle. He didn't have to climb up to the top rope either. His feet could be on the second buckle. And then when you start to give the guy the move, he can push off with one foot on the top rope. Most people might not even notice it. And you're going over. But while your feet are on the second rope, you have a base for your balance. The guy inside has those the top rope going around his knees, right below his knees, if he's a grown adult man. And you can brace yourself that way. And the other guy sitting on the, going the other direction, he's got something to push off of, to grab a hold of, that's not the shit that he's sitting on. It's easier to balance on the second rope and to not make it look phony. Because for both people to get up on the top rope with their feet and nothing else to take that bump that's 18 whole inches higher, you have to gingerly help each other up there like you're pulling a baby out of a fucking well. And it looks so bullshit phony. And it's dangerous. How many times have you seen people, Brian, fall off the second turnbuckle and fall out of the ring? Off the second turnbuckle? Yes. I mean, I've seen them intentionally do that a bunch of times. Well, no, I'm talking about accidentally. How many times people that are on the second rope, either inside the ring or even outside the ring, slip or accidentally fall off out to the floor? Pretty rarely. How many times have you seen that happen when people are standing up on the top rope? Somewhat more frequently. There you go. There's a reason for that. So anyway, I hope Charlotte's okay, but it looked like it fucked her up. And there's that. <sighs> and then Nick Aldis was in his office with CM Punk. And Aldis hands him the contract and says, I'll let you look at this and leaves. And that's what I mentioned before, and we're not going to see Punk be the anti-authority guy. He may be anti-authority, but he's not going to be physically abusing Aldous. But as Aldous leaves, Punk's looking at the contract, Cody walks in. And they're kind of standing there looking at each other. Cody said, well, it sounds like to finish your story, 
you need to win the Royal Rumble. Yeah. Cody said, that's interesting. And Cody offers his hand and says, welcome back, old friend. And Punk shakes it. And they wouldn't be having these conversations if it wasn't going to mean something. But we don't know what yet or how or in what form or fashion. And then they continued that before you comment on this, L.A. Knight and Orton were in the back. And Orton wasn't really happy about teaming up with L.A. Knight because L.A. Knight got there after Orton left. They don't know each other. Can he trust this guy? But then Punk walks up and says, good luck, boys, and walks off. And then Orton says to L.A. Knight, are, are you ready? And L.A. Knight, yeah. And off we go. This is like, it's almost getting to be the end of the show at uh, the old days of Crockett Promotions, Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, where they just send three or four of the top mini baby faces that they had to go out and just say a couple of things about their big angle, and that was all they needed. But it, they're, they're all interacting with, with Punk already. Yeah, usually I'm against the whole, and the camera's there, why is it there, filming these conversations, what purpose. Makes sense here. CM Punk's in the back. Follow him with a camera. There you See go. See <laughs> what he does, who he hits. They've done nothing but build up intrigue with Punk and everyone. He's aligned himself with no one, even the people that he's literally either called or been referred to as a friend by, like Cody. There's a tense, not awkwardness, but a tense feeling there. Yeah, well, and when he says that a lot of the people who have welcomed him back also realize he's now in their way. And the good thing is it's not AEW, WWE. We'll draw this out, hopefully not too long. We may not see him wrestle until the Rumble. There may not be any reason for him to wrestle before Don't the Rumble. think he should. They're not hurting for ratings. They don't need desperate ploys. So, you know, you want to see CM Punk? Watch the Royal Rumble. It's going to be the biggest ever. Well, we shall see what happens. Yeah. Well, anyway, so. And then they started the entrances for our main event, which was Solo and Uso against L.A. Knight and Ortno. Uh, and I liked it because they only took eight minutes tonight or that night for the entrances for the, you know, for the main event. So they actually had 15 minutes left on the air when they rang the bell for the match. And have you noticed now that not only next to a lot of the people on this roster, but next to everybody we're watching in modern wrestling, Randy Orton now looks like Andre the fucking Giant? He also does look pretty big, bigger than he was before he left, but he looks gigantic compared to well, I mean, he's, he, he the... Can't, he can't take supplements and grow four inches. He looks six foot eight now next to all these other fucking guys. Wait. When did he suddenly get so fucking tall? He's a giant now. He was he was one of the normal guys at OVW. Fucking hell. Anyway, they did the thing where Orton and LA Knight do the reluctant, not reluctant, but the they tag themselves in when the other guy doesn't know it's coming because there's tension there. But then suddenly, because I guess they figured they're running late, Uso just nailed Randy from behind and they went to the break in two minutes. And they came back and they got some heat on Orton for about 30 seconds. And then he made an ice cold tag to LA Knight. And it, again, it's not, when I say he made it, it wasn't his fault. Nobody was trying to fucking stop him. These fucking guys cannot set up a hot tag to save their lives. And I'll say it again for the newbies out there in the audience. If the baby face that has been selling can make a tag to his partner and it's obvious to the fans in the arena that he cannot be caught, cannot be stopped, his way is unobstructed, and he's so close, nobody else is anywhere remotely around him to be able to prevent it, it ain't a fucking hot tag. It's a foregone conclusion and you kill your pop. So Ice Cold Tag to L.A. Knight makes a comeback did a nice Bobby Eaton running neck breaker. And then Solo stopped him and they got heat on LA Knight for about fucking 
a minute, maybe. And now Jimmy Uso's punches, I use punches in quotation marks, both those brothers are killing me. But Jimmy now, his punch is an open-handed slap to the forehead that he then shows to the fans afterwards. Did you see that one? I'm now watching it because of you, yeah. He fucking slapped him in the head with an open hand and then held an open hand up to the fans with a follow-through. Like, see that? It's like the old deal where you're showing the referee, I didn't hit him with a fist. It was an open hand. He really did hit him with an open hand. It's not even illegal. What the fuck do they think people are blind? They're not goddamn magicians. They're not sleight of hand experts. Who was that goddamn guy that did the as seen on TV magic kit when I was a kid? I've got it on one of the shelves around here, but I can't see the fine print. Anyway, so then L.A. Knight gave Randy Orton an even colder tag. He was right in front of him, and nobody was preparing or trying to even stop him. But the fans popped for it kind of anyway because it's Orton. And he made a comeback, and boom, 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 and hit his draping DDT, and then Solo stopped Randy from behind. And then L.A. Knight DDT'd Solo and then went to use his BFT on Jimmy Uso, the BFT and the DDT went to hit the BFT on Uso and Randy snatched him out of the grasp of the BFT to hit the RKO one, two, three. So Randy stole LA Knight's victory, but they shook hands anyway, but there's tension. RKO BFT FYI Tension. Why OU? Tension. That's the uh, big thing now. You got to have the proper amount of tension. You can't just be slack and limp and flaccid like Tony is. Roman Reigns back next week. Back next week on the SmackDown to be confronted by who? Who knows who? L.A. Knight, Randy Orton, CM Punk, Nick Aldis, Logan Paul, Pat McAfee. Bronco Nagurski. Oh, come on. Now, you, now you're going too far. Loud noises. 